at the college seriously when I was, when I had applied to be the president and so forth. My own evaluation, as I told the trustees at that first August meeting after I took office, was that it had a strong first two years, culminating in a comprehensive exam. But the last two years were anticlimactic. And so the first thing I did was to cast about for something for the last two years. They did have a sort of, they called it a thesis or something like that, but it wasn't any big thing. And I combined my experiences at Harvard and Oxford in my initial thought of a, of a, of a plan. At Harvard, I had uh, concentrated in Greek history and literature, which involved history and literature and art and philosophy, many different subjects. I liked that. At Oxford, I had concentrated just in English language and literature. And I liked two years, which is essentially what I was really focusing in on something and going deep. And so I sort of combined the two and the thought of a plan where, where these things would be possible. That was sort of the initial thought. But as I say in the memoir, uh, really, the faculty worked it over. We worked it over for two semesters, the spring of um, 59 and the fall of 59. And they made it much more. They made it an, an enabling act. Uh, they, I, I use the example of John MacArthur. It, the requirement was that there had to be uh, written examinations oral examinations and a thesis. And the weights could vary between the thesis and the written exams. Uh, but I had merely in mind three-hour examinations, uh, sort of traditional. And John MacArthur immediately saw the opportunity and began to give one-week open lab exams. And then the rest of us joined. I used to give a combination of one-week open book exams and closed book exams. And I think of it still as basically an enabling act. One key to it, one strong key to it, uh, was that it was not just independent study. It was um, always uh, vetted by a faculty member. So that the student, it was a dialogue between the faculty member and the student. But why did you say that? Uh, did you consider this? Did you consider that? Um, that I recognized early. What I did not recognize till much later was another aspect of the uh, plan, which was that it started where the student was intellectually at that moment. And it didn't matter what it was. My roommate in college uh, studied physics and became a lawyer. I studied Greek history and literature and ended English, teaching English literature. It didn't matter. It was a matter of, of teaching students to think. Uh, but in doing this, they were creating something. The initiative was theirs. And that can carry on into life after college. We were not graduating students who were round pegs to go in round holes. We were saying to them, in a sense, uh, you have a, a, an intellectual or artistic stimulus somewhere go make use of it. And if it doesn't exist out there for you, create it. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't recognize that at first. I recognized that later. I think in the, in the original uh, plan as it was packed by the faculty, uh, the illustrations were used of it can be chemistry and biology, it can be history and literature. Uh, what surprised me was some of the creativity of some of these, like the student who did an interdisciplinary plan in chemistry and pottery because she wanted to master the chemistry of glazes. It made sense. The only thing is that it had to make sense to the faculty. But what was really different was that this was a faculty that was creating a college. And that's always a different feeling. The pioneers, and I think that's the word that's used for the early students too, they have a different attitude toward what they're doing than people who inherit, inherit a place which is already in being. They can modify it, they can change it a little bit, but it's different from creating it.